Well, hi there, folks. Mr. Bleeker here. First major topic for eCampus Live Biology 12 is cell structure and function. Now, you might have studied this in junior science. In the BC curriculum, you would have studied it around grade 8 and parts in the science curriculum leading forward from there. Now, at that point, you studied what the parts were and what they did. When we get up to this level, we'll do that but then we'll want to know how all these parts work together. And the next major topic after this, for example, is DNA. And then we talk about how these parts are made and how they're coded for. It's very fascinating and it's the stuff of second year biology courses, third year graduate study. There's an entire course on the cell membrane coming for those of you who choose to, to study the biological sciences moving forward. But we'll get going. The lesson on parts of the cell I already have open in a tab here. As stated before um, in my introduction, the lesson will be here. Uh, take a look at examples and assignments, things you need to do. And then there's uh, quiz material down here. Uh, right now you're probably wondering what these grayed out areas are. Sometimes I have old components of the course and I can make them visible or invisible. Those grayed out ones that you see here, hmm, not so important for you. But I digress, we'll move on go. So cellular theory is quite important for us to discuss and how all these components work together. So we'll jump right in. There's two major slideshows or you can think of them as information packets, whichever you'd like. Part one, part two here. Animations that you'll want to really keep an eye on. If you're like me, if you kind of learn a lot through video or you like to interact with video and, and sort of quiz yourself and get to know things better, these animations are pure gold. They're great. Um, it's a lot better than for me than just writing it down on paper. Everybody learns differently, but you need to know your stuff. You can't move forward with your projects without having the knowledge base component in place. So make sure that you know these parts. You sure you can always come back and look up things, but it's good to get your homework out of the way. The cytoskeleton, literally what it means, cyto meaning cell and skeleton meaning, well, what holds it all together? Why doesn't this little sort of biological blob just fall apart. It does have its own skeleton just like we do so we'll take a peek at that. There's some nice YouTube animations here but I digress we'll get going. So I'm just gonna kick in AirPlay and yes I'm working on my iPad works pretty well though and there we go. Okay so We'll begin with, oh, there we go. We'll begin with what we call cytology. So that's Latin, there's two words there. Um, and I'm kind of tired of the blue, so I'm gonna switch off to purple. Cyto means cell, and logi means study of. So right now you're in a biology course, bio, living, logi, study of. Just a little Latin out of the way, but you probably got that from me in grade 11. Before we go to observe cells, we have to be able to see them. They're extremely small. For example, you look at red blood cells anywhere sort of down on the 50 micrometer scale. And by micrometer, you might remember this crazy little symbol, right? That's called mu. I'm accentuating it there. That is one millionth of a meter or 10 to the minus 6 of a meter. They're very small. If you recall from biology 11 when we studied viruses, they were even a thousand times smaller where we were looking at billions of meters. And I always say imagine taking a meter stick and chopping it up into a million equivalent sized pieces. It just boggles the mind how something could be alive and that small. Millions, billions, but our cells are about that big. And considering we have you know, around 100 trillion cells at various points in our lifetime, it's a, it's amazing that we need that many tiny cells to function as this multicellular organism we call Homo sapiens. The light microscope, and I'll just pop out to an example of that, uh, the one that you've taken a peek at in school would be like this, and we've thrown in some slides for good measure. It's called compound because it has a couple of parts to it. So I'll just I'll annotate a few of them. So it's asking me what I'm going to call it. So 
this here is the ocular lens. Sorry for cursive, but it works really well with a with the stylus on an iPad. So that's your ocular lens, and it always magnifies by a power of 10. That's fairly repetitive stuff. And you probably saw this in grade 8, for example. Keeping to the lenses, and I'll come back to the other parts in a minute, there will be three, but they're here. And these lenses right here are called the objective lenses. Let me try some printing here. There you go. There's three lenses. You'll see that there's low, medium, and high. And when you look at their powers, low is, on most microscopes, will magnify by a power of 4, medium by a power of 10. There we go. And high by 40. Now, there's sort of a super lens on some of these microscopes. Um, it would be the fourth lens. We call it the oil immersion lens. You can think of it as ultra high. And in class, I'll show you how we use it with oil. A little drop of oil is uh, dabbed onto our, our slide or what we're going to look at on a, on a piece of glass so that we can dip the lens into it and get sort of ultra high magnification. And the oil helps to collect the light a little bit so that we can get upwards of, get this, 100 times magnification. Now, when you start to combine these magnifications, sort of have to uh, pop out here, change the color. Let's go with green. The ocular lens, when the image comes up, will always get magnified by a power of 10. So the image that has been magnified through an objective lens, I'll just draw a little nexus point there. Another one here. There's two magnifications, one when you come out the ocular lens and one when you go through the objective lens. So just I'll write in green to the right, when you include, when you include the ocular, basically throwing on a zero, the total magnification goes up. Um, low becomes 40 times. Medium becomes 100. High, this is why where it starts to get quite blurry, high will become 400 times zoomed. So that's that's a tremendous amount of zoom. And the reason we needed oil to help collect the light, this becomes 1,000 times magnified. Now, I don't know about you, but if I zoomed in on something 1,000 times, it would probably get pretty blurry. Just imagine cozying up to your TV by uh, several focal lengths. And you'll know what I mean. It's, it's very hard to maintain the... Um, resolution when you zoom in that closely. So the parts of the microscope um, we all know and love. I'll just go over sort of quickly here. Uh, let's go with a, uh, ah, we'll go back with the light blue now. You've got your ocular and objective lenses. You've got a coarse focus knob. Now that moves the stage up and down like this. And by moving the stage up and down, we bring the specimen a little bit closer, a little bit further away. Just helps us to uh, focus on what we're looking at. The coarse focus knob is, is great. There will be, um, usually down here, and I'll draw it, you'll see a sort of a smaller knob. And that one would be for fine focus, just small adjustments of the stage. So uh, the fine focus knob does exactly what it says. Some sort of mundane things here. This is called the base for obvious reasons. The arm, the thing you hold on to so the microscope doesn't crash down onto the floor. You can have your light source. It's not going to let me write that very easily, but there we go. There's your light source. And underneath, uh, in class, I'll show you, there's something called a, um, a an iris diaphragm. It's basically um, a small hole that you can make bigger or smaller depending on how much light you want to let through. And it's a lot like the iris in your eye. So it, it can be wide open to let a lot of light through or it could be really small to let very little light through. 
And sometimes you, you don't want to let all the light through. If you let it through and the, the specimen is really thin, let, let's say a, an onion cell or a cheek cell, all that bright light will just make it so that you can't see your specimen at all. It'll just be too bright. Not all that many specimen offer enough contrast. So controlling the light is very important. Um, we'll be working obviously with slides. You've probably seen these before for mounting your specimen, prepared or otherwise. And you'll get this little thing every now and then to work with slides called a cover slip. And a cover slip, let's see here. Whew, I need a new status. The press harder. There you go. The cover slip is a little piece of glass that you can put down sort of as an extra sort of little window towards your specimen. You can put oil on top of it um, so that you can use the oil immersion lens. Um, you don't want to dip your lenses directly into water, for example. That's not what you want to do when you're using the microscope. Not at all. The collective, um, there's one more thing that warrants a little bit of mentioning here. I'll change the color just so we can see it. When you go to grab the ocular lenses here, I'll just highlight in brown, you'll grab this thing right here and it revolves. And so it's often called the revolving nose piece. Nose piece for short. And that's just a basic introduction to the parts of the microscope. I thought we'd just get that out of the way. You've probably seen it before. Um, as we use a microscope, we always talk about what the parts do. The, uh, the only problems I've seen students have with the microscope are generally with the, with the iris diaphragm down here, this thing. Um, that can be a little bit of a problem. But we sort that out as we go along. OK, into cell structures. Back we go. The lenses magnify the images, and I showed that on the, sort of the previous um, portion of the video. What's really great is when you get to the electron microscope, and instead of bouncing sort of clumsy light waves off objects, we can bounce electrons, and we do it in a vacuum. If you've ever looked out over the edge of your truck in the midday, and you see the heat coming off of uh, basically off the front of your truck, you'll see that it bends the light waves. And that's the problem with air and the density of different materials. The density of the materials can bend the light waves and you can get this scattering and that's how we get a mirage. Now what we want to do with an electron microscope is to bounce light waves off the object and then we can sort of view them with a special sort of receiving, uh, you can think of it as a television, or we can bounce the light waves, th light or the uh, electrons through and see the structures inside of the cell, for example, in extremely great detail. It goes anywhere from 100,000 to a million times magnification. Okay, so I'm going to pop out just for a second. Uh, I want to show you what the um, electron microscope looks like. Now the electron microscope, um, these are quite expensive things you would uh, universities for example are sort of the uh, only entities that can really afford these things or major sort of uh, major research labs so here we go um, it takes a lot of let's see if I can zoom that out it takes a lot of energy to run these because you have to maintain a vacuum inside of that large tube and you can see at the bottom that there's two um, places for you to look into there's also a computer screen so they'll bounce electrons off an object. That's when they're scanning it so they get a, a look on the outside. Or they'll bounce electrons, uh, transmit electrons through the object, and then you get a sort of a flat image. So this is quite a machine. Um, this is uh, quite small when you think, when I'm, uh, I hate to say back in my day, these things took up entire rooms. So an electron microscope, let's just go to images for one second. An electron microscope, when it's doing scanning work, can give you an image that looks like this. Now you're looking at, for example, you're looking at pollen grains here. And we can see that we coat them with a little, uh, with the scanning electron microscope, we coat them in uh, sort of a fine metal. 
uh, gold, for example. And then we have the electrons scatter along the surface. And as they bounce off, we get a three-dimensional image. And it's pretty neat. We'll go to few, full magnification here and take a look. And it's just fabulous. When you look at what pollen grains look like, you can see why that doesn't really feel good going up your nose. So it look like spiked little mace balls. Now that's what a scanning electron microscope would do. You give up um, extreme magnification for a really great surface detail. And when you look at things, for example, like fleas, um, poor little guy's dead. But I think I saw this in an alien movie here not too long ago. Right? Well, this says it's a hydrothermal vent worm, but um, fleas will have similar sort of nasty features. Now, here's a good diagram right here, courtesy of how stuff works. And when you look at it, there's an electron gun at the top that fires electrons down towards your specimen. Now, in order to focus the electrons, we use um, really strong electromagnets. And that will push the electron beam down to kind of a fine point, almost like you think of it as the tip of a pencil. And when it strikes down at the bottom, it can either go through the specimen like that, or um, it can, if we've coated the specimen uh, for the scanning electron microscope in, say, a fine metal, we can observe the electrons bouncing off sort of omni in an omnidirectional or all directional way and get an idea of what it looks like. But you have your uh, detectors in there, and more or less they'll pick up the image. Now, if it's a transmission electron micrograph, If the electrons go all the way through, then what you'll get is you'll get an image like this, where when the electrons are absorbed by the darker structures, well, they're, the images will appear darker. So it looks like we're looking at um, little bags of things inside of the cell, looking at little vacuoles, it would seem. Um, when you look at this, so the electrons would be absorbed and you'd have dark regions. And when the electrons go all the way through, you'd have light regions. This is a flat two dimensional image. So it's this one's all about the transmission electron microscope. Do those electrons transmit through? That's a lot different than a scanning electron microscope, which would give you those nice sort of three dimensional images that you see, for example, in this, right? When you look at a pollen grain, pretty neat looking. pop out. In addition to using things like electron microscopes, we can also add sort of like radioactive little tags to a cell. Um, certain protein subunits can be radioactively labeled and we could see where they go around in the cell. It's kind of neat. Trace their journey. Another neat thing that I had an opportunity to use in university was called a centrifuge. This is the concept of spinning. I don't know if you've ever gone to um, the fair and gone on one of those rides where you stand up and they spin you very quickly, right? And that's, you've heard, probably heard of centrifugal force and centripetal force if you've taken physics. But the idea is if you spin something at an extreme rate, a very, very high rev RPM or revolutions per minute, you can separate out the thin components from the, or well, think of them as, as lighter components from the heavier components. And what we see when we do that, if we take whole cells and we um, give them the old crush of doom here with a pestle and we mash them. My daughters play Dragon City. That just, I'll have to <laughs> make sure that doesn't come up again, but oh well. Um, mortar and pestle and you mash it all up. And if you spin it at higher and higher speeds, you can get the lightweight materials separated out on top and the heavier components, heavier fragments in the bottom. So what's neat is you can literally pull out what you want, and I'll just draw this as if it's a small probe for pulling these out. You could extract those components, think of it almost uh, as pulling them out, sucking them out, and studying them in greater detail. And it's pretty neat. So the Depending on the speed, you can get out with the lightweight components and the heavyweight components. It's a handy technique. 
Now there's some important people, a little plug for some more important people that discovered some things. I'll gloss over it fairly quickly. I don't ask test questions on these individuals. So let's give some big ups here for Zacharias Jensen, good old, around the uh, 1600s there. The invention of the compound microscope, we have to go back and give um, Egyptians, for example, um, huge credit for the work that they were doing in polishing and refining glass. It's not like polished refined glass was, you know, first sort of perfected by Zacharias Jensen and, and you know, he worked towards inventing the first compound microscope. But when it comes to inventing the first microscope, um, the first microscope, I'll just pop out, was fairly simple. By simple, it had only one lens. And um, if you've heard of Anton van Leeuwenhoek, for example, um, let's go to images. This was sort of the first microscope that he was working with. A simple microscope. Uh, every, ah, there it is. That's the one I wanted. So they call it simple because it had one lens indicated, as you can see, and you would hold this thing up and you would put your sample there where it says the sample holder and you would just sort of hold it an arm's length and bring it up to your eye and you were just sort of magnifying it almost as if it was sort of like a magnifying glass and it was a good idea but it only magnified with one lens still around the late 1600s that was you were able to see the little pond water critters in water so pretty amazing how that uh, sort of well, Anton van Leeuwenhoek is sort of called the father of, of uh, microscopy for a reason because of the work that was started with this simple solitary lens. Pop out. But it wasn't very long in when they started to figure out, well, you know, if we two used more than one lens in a compound way, that's that's what they mean by compound, multiple lenses, that you could have sort of a larger image. Now, once they started to look at the images, Robert Hooke, 1665, thereabouts, um, takes a look at cork. And if you've ever looked at dead cork, you, this is where you find out why they call cells cells. So I'll just go in there. Now, it literally owes its name to the cells that you would see in a monastery. Let's go to images. Cork cells, sort of these dead, sort of hollowed out cells, um, look, well, at least reminded Leeuwenhoek, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, um, and other researchers at the time of little cells in monasteries where the monks would do their work. It was given the name cells because literally it was just like this little tiny room. And the name stuck forevermore. So you can give Robert Hooke credit because he was the first person to call them cells, um, but early researchers just adopted the name. There's our father of modern microscopy, Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Um, when he was looking into pond water, he saw protists. Now, if you recall from grade 11, protists are those little pond water critters, um, paramecia, euglena, and it was a whole new universe that no one had ever perceived. In fact, they had found one of the six major kingdoms of life. Looking at them, they were swimming around, eating things, and, and they were called animalcules animal molecules at first. So that's an interesting little turn of phrase from Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Robert Brown comes along in 1831 and he manages to find the nucleus of a cell. So this is all to be expected. It's, it's sort of like the internet. Once it started rolling, it sort of exploded and everybody started sharing their findings. A couple of important figures come up after this. Uh, Schleiden and Schwann, uh, Matthias Schleiden, 1838, noticed that plants were made up of cells as well. They weren't just studying animal cells. Um, they started to study, of course, multicellular organisms and said, hey, you know, Schleiden noticed that things are made up of cells. And then uh, Theodore Schwann stated, oh, well, so are animals. Animals are made up of cells. In fact, if you look at the definition of animals and plants, they're multicellular organisms. So these theories begin to converge. And we come up with good old, I like to call him Rudy Virchow here, around coming up 
just so eight, middle 1800s and sort of came up with what we called the cell theory that cells arrive arise from existing cells so cells have parents okay got it and that new cells don't just pop out of nowhere it's not spontaneous generation they come as a consequence of reproduction makes sense And this slide, hmm, a little messed up. I'm just going to pause and come back. Okay, so Rudy Virchow, Rudolf Virchow, came up with the components that are known as the cell theory. And it seems a little redundant, but really what it's saying is cells come from other cells. So component number one, and you do need to know the cell theory. So we'll just put a big old testable on here. So cells come from existing cells. Okay. So we'll, oops, undo that there back to my highlighter so cells come from pre-existing cells okay so cell that's one uh, cells have parents there's also the idea that cells are the building blocks of life uh, come here you there we go cells are the building blocks of life okay so that's one you hear all the time living things are made of cells right up to the point where somebody says hmm what about viruses well this is cell theory viruses aren't cells so that's for a different topic they're the basic building blocks of life. Everything is composed of cells. There we go. Everything's composed of cells. They're the building blocks and cells have parents. Three just basic tenets of the cell theory. Now, when it comes to processes of cells, a couple of things you need to know about them. First of all, cells eat. So it's all about nutrition. They need it. And your digestive system is largely the gateway to get those nutrients into us as multicellular organisms. Now, nutrition is different than digestion. Uh, we'll study the digestive unit. But the digestive unit is all about breaking down physically and enzymatically uh, what you've consumed so that it's smaller, smaller parts. Um, if you don't believe me, well, just try to eat that steak all at once, right? It, it just doesn't work. It's got to be broken up into a large surface area. The reason we go through digestion, mechanical or chemical, is so that we can absorb it. So absorption becomes pretty important because we're really after the goodness in there, the food, the water, the uh, calcium, magnesium, sodium, those materials that our bodies need to continue functioning. For example, your nerve cells wouldn't do too well without potassium or sodium. Once we've absorbed these nutrients, we can use them to build things up in our body. So that's what they mean by biosynthesis. Bio meaning life. And synthesis meaning to build. Or to build up. And it takes, we have to generate energy to run our bodies. So it's not just good enough to take in you know, proteins and fats and things like that. Um, we literally have to throw them into the oven and they need to be by the oven. If you recall, let's go back to grade eight. If you recall the, the mitochondria, the energy powerhouse of the cell, something has to provide the energy to keep the lights on in the place. And by generating energy, burning fuel, we're talking about respiration. And not just the, when you hear respiration, you think of breathing. But the whole point of breathing is to get that oxygen into your body. And where does it go? Well, that oxygen in your body needs to go to your cells. And why does the oxygen go to your cells? Because it needs to get to your mitochondria. These little... Draw it like that. These little guys that with O2, 
generate energy. And we'll talk about that more specifically, but they provide the chemical energy for the cell to run off of. When we're all said and done uh, with basically the food that we've consumed, those uh, materials ex are excreted out. Okay, so excretion, you've probably heard of it. Cells not only ex excrete, but they can uh, secrete. <laughs> Stumbling all over that one. And by secrete, for example, if you think about this, if you think about your pancreas, right, your pancreas secretes insulin. Let's make an end there. So your pancreas secretes insulin. Um, your skin secretes oil. Your sebaceous glands secrete oil. So that's not exactly sort of a new idea. And with all this energy, your body can undergo... Uh, ooh, let's not use green. That'll be a weird color. You can use all of this for reproduction. What can you do with that? You could also go through movement. In fact, there's some fabulous uh, parts of this lecture where we look at movement of uh, materials in the cell and... Um, there's one part that I just love where vacuoles, little bags of things, of food and, and waste products, etc., how they're moved around in the cell. A neat little sort of walking on a tightrope thing I have to show you. And finally, cells will egest. And that's kind of like excretion, but that's when you have materials that are literally insoluble. They, they, they can't even be used by the cells. And um, egestion is an important part of excretion. Eukaryotic cells, if we go back to studying, um, if we go back to biology 11, if you look at, at your garden variety cell here, I'll just draw one, make it look like an amoeba, they're eukaryotic because they have their DNA, I'll switch up the color here, in bound in a nucleus. So there we go. So your DNA is in the nucleus here inside of a membrane. In fact, the major organelles in the cell are all bagged or have a membrane, by and large. So we'll go like that. Call that our nucleus. Nucleus. There you go. That membrane is called a plasma membrane. Uh, that's kind of a formal name for it. And everything's floating around in the cell. Like Everything in the cell needs something to hold it up. So if you went out for a swim, for example, you would be floating around in the swimming pool. What's a little bit different about cells is it, I always say it's for these little parts, it's almost like, um, it's almost like they're floating around in like hair gel. It's for these small components, it's very thick to them. Uh, we would consider it watery, but for those guys, these little parts in the cell, um, it, the organelles, mini organs, Okay, so for these small parts in the cell, these little organelles, they float around in, a, in sort of a, a thick material that we call the cytoplasm. I'll give that a definition. That's pretty important. There we go. But what really would hold everything together? When you look at a cell, it's got this very thin skin. Well, without going into too much detail because this will come up in a later sort of lecture there's little thin filaments they're they're so small that they're not really even seen unless they're sort of radioactively labeled and those little filaments are called cytoskeletal fibers now there's several fibers that make up the skeleton of a cell there's actin there's uh, there's these ones we call microtubules. There's these ones we call intermediate filaments. Those are sort of the big players that we talk about in grade 12. And they all sort of have different purposes in the cell. Uh, I like to make an analogy that the cytoskeleton of the cell is almost like sort of biological rebar for the cell. If you've ever seen rebar, it's that material that they put into um, concrete to give the concrete something to form around. Yeah, that's, that's a good analogy. It's not a bad one. So we'll move into what makes an animal cell different from a plant cell. Now, animal cells are kind of unique. They, when you look at your typical animal cell, let's just pop out for a second.
and a quick trip to the web will call up a, a, an animal cell. This is kind of cute. First thing you notice about an animal cell, it's got all these components, all these fancy names, but it's got a skin around the outside, the cell membrane. And there's that big pink nucleus in the middle, and there's a little spot inside the nucleus, kind of a special region we call the nucleolus. And we could get to all of that. Okay, It's kind of neat. But animal cells are different than plant cells. First thing you notice, no cell wall. And um, they don't have cell walls, and that makes them fairly flexible. Now what's different than a cross section of an animal cell is when you look at a plant cell. So if we go back to, just call it up quickly here. If you take a look at a plant cell, the first thing you'll notice in any diagram that you're given, obviously they appear a lot more green. Around the outside there, you'll see that they have a cell wall. And plants aren't exactly the most mobile organisms, multicellular organisms on the planet, nor do they need to be. They're solar powered collectors of energy that use sunlight, carbon dioxide, water to make sugar. That's what photosynthesis is all about. These guys can make their own fuel. Now, admittedly, they then turn around and burn it. They use their own fuel, right? Glucose to run cells. Those little red guys in there, mitochondria, we'll talk about them more, but they're what supply all the energy in the cell. Now, because plants do this, they're the basis of all light of all life on the planet. Because they make the sugar on the planet and that gets consumed and moved up the food chain. I'll pop out here. So when we talk about animals versus plant cells, there's some different kind of structures that you would see um, in each. Now, I think that the one that sort of goes without saying is chloroplasts. Plants are green because they have these little uh, green structures in them that do photosynthesis. Plants also have a cell wall. That's what's right here. So I'll just sort of darken it here. And it's made up of a starch. Uh, we talked about this in Biology 11. The starch is known as cellulose. It's a special kind of carbohydrate. And plants, when you look into the middle of them, I'll just pop out here for a second, you might have noticed in this plant cell right here that there is a, let's go to view image, full size, that there is a large sort of light green material in the middle. And that's a large, cent what we call a central vacuole. Plants need water for photosynthesis, so they'll have a huge bag of it, and I'm highlighting it here, uh, they'll have a huge bag of it in the middle of their cells. When plants wilt, that bag will shrink a little bit, and the um, cell will sort of, sort of uh, collapse in on itself a little bit. But the good news is, once you give them a little bit more water and that bag in the middle inflates, it pushes out and then the cell stops wilting. Pop back here. In this slide, what you're looking at here, you'll see that because the central vacuole, CV, right here is full of water, that it pushes outwards. So when you look at organelles, for example, this is a chloroplast, I'll just say chloro for short, it gets pushed out towards the edge. Even the nucleus gets pushed out towards the edge. That's what that bag of water can do. It can literally push everything out. And it's kind of neat because in the course, at one point, we'll look at this plant called Elodia, and we could see the cytoplasm swirling around the vacuole this big vacuole in the middle, almost as if there's a current in there. It's quite neat. So plant cells have some unique structures, right? Large central vacuole, which is what we saw here. Come here, pen tool. There we go. Large central vacuole right there. They have a cell wall and they have chloroplasts. You don't see those in animal cells. Why? Well, animal cells aren't photosynthesizing. Okay. Animals are heterotrophs. They eat other things. So we're a little bit more unique. We have, uh, we'll go back to animals now. Oops, undo that there for a second. We have flagella, and that should look like a sperm because that's the flagella on the end, right? Flagellated cells. There we go, this little guy here. So that's a little bit more motility. Um, you might recall from 
uh, biology 11 that flagella are uh, would be used um, some plants their sex cells have it but plants themselves don't use flagella for motion you'll see it on the sex cells um, in animal cells flagella is much more common we also have these um, animal cells that is we have these things called lysosomes this guy over here number two Come here, give me the writing tool. There we go. This guy is called a lysosome. And we have that because inside, right here, and I'll do a little darkening here, these enzymes help animal cells to digest things. So because we're consuming things all the time, inside of a cell, it's got to have some way of breaking down even the food that arrives. If protein arrives, that has to be broken down into amino acids. And if carbohydrates arrive, they have to be broken down into sugars. Your digestive system, think of it this way, gets a lot of the job done, but sometimes the cell literally needs to finish the job. So these little bags called lysosomes have enzymes in them, and these things float around. In, you, you find them in animal cells, and they do a job of digesting. They're very much sort of an animal invention. There's exceptions to every rule, mind you, but this is largely an animal-based thing. Uh, another thing animals have is something called centrioles. And if you look at that, it's kind of interesting. I'll zoom in here. These little, you can see these little rings. And if you look at each one of those, I'll just sort of expand. It looks like this, these three sort of tube-shaped ends. And centrioles are important because they're used in cellular division. We'll talk about that more as we go along, but you don't find that in plant cells. They have something a little older called a centrosome. But if you see a structure like that, and I always say it kind of looks like a minigun if you've ever seen an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, that gun that spins around and shoots bullets um, at a high rate of speed, centrioles look a lot like that. They always struck me that way. Cell wall uh, there's an interesting analogy being made here, um, almost like the Great Wall of China, for example. It keeps everything in in a plant cell. It gives it a lot more structure, right? Gives it a definite shape. Um, yeah, and plants are just just have that much more protection than animal cells do, and that's really what this is talking about. When you find cell walls, you have to understand in nature, plants a plant cell wall can be different than a fungus's cell wall, which is different than the cell walls of bacteria, for example. Plants will use cellulose, and fungi use the same material that you find in the shell of a crab, chitin. And it's, it's a different, flexible kind of carbohydrate. Chitin is the reason, uh, if you're ever eating shrimp, it's the, it's the shell you don't eat. It's, it's very indigestible to us. And if you look at bacteria, oops, cancel, I don't want to print that, right? They're using a, a sort of a special starch called peptidoglycan, which we talked about in biology 11. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter really so much what it's made out of for this sort of this slide where we're talking. It matters that it provides support. And that's sort of the overriding theme. All right, let's see if I can bring this in. Now, there's a great number of things that come up in the plant cell, and this is a nice overview. I'll see if I can. I need to get rid of this getting in my way. Let's see here. If I can dismiss this entirely. No, switches, switches back. And no. Hmm, okay. We'll go around it and identify things as need be. You've got cellulosal <laughs> cytoskeletal fibers. Say that five times fast, and they're just showing a few here. And the idea of cytoskeleton uh, within the cell is to give it structure. There's our chloroplasts, and it's kind of neat because when you look at it, they'll look like rolls of sort of like um, green, um, almost like green coins. And that's actually where the photosynthesis really happens. It's neat. If you ever study it, get a chance to really take a close look. We'll be studying the Golgi body. 
this large, oops, stay there, buddy, this large uh, stack of what looks like sort of um, crescent shaped pancakes. That's really important. Um, it helps the Golgi body tells things in the cell where to go, often called the traffic hop of the cell. Now we all know about the nucleus, this structure down here. It's interesting how it looks like a moon with craters on top. Now the nucleus, zoom out a little bit, is made up of quite a few things. It's got the little pores, and that's going to be important because the information in the nucleus has to get out. I'll just tell you that much now. The DNA, you can think of as those little squigglies, and DNA like that we call chromatin. Um, DNA itself isn't packaged in chromosomes all the time. It floats around almost like gooey snot, sort of shoelace particles um, in the uh, in the uh, well in the cytoplasm of the nucleus. Now the cytoplasm of the nucleus, of course, because you're in the nucleus, they call it nucleoplasm. I think you get the idea. The cytoplasm of the nucleus and the skin of the um, nucleus is sometimes called the envelope. These are just synonyms. You could call it the, the nuclear membrane, the nuclear envelope. But if you look close at that envelope, you'll see these little extensions, these sort of like little folds. And that's important. Those little folds are known as, wait for it, they're known as endoplasmic reticulum. Now those folds, if they have ribosomes on them, we'll say that they're rough or studded. And if the folds uh, extend further out into the nucleus and they don't have those, we call those smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It's the little, um, think of think of it as putting like little grains on the material. If there's grains on there, it's rough. If these little grains, these little ribosomes aren't on there, it's smooth. And that has a lot to do with protein production. There's our, um, pull it over here, there's our central vacuole, which is our big water bag in the cell. And you can see it's, vacuoles are extremely large bags of material. They're named after what's inside of them. So we call this one the central vacuole. But if you had a small vacuole, just a little guy, we don't call it a vacuole, we call it a vesicle. And that's how most materials are transported around in the cell, or like in these little bags. So vacuole big, vesicle small. Let's zoom out. Oop, there we go. The cell wall is on the perimeter. And just underneath it in blue there, you'll see the plasma membrane. So it's kind of like, um, uh, think of someone in medieval armor, right? They've got the armor on the outside. And then just underneath it, that's them. That's the skin. And in a lot of ways, that's exactly how a cell is designed. Well, a plant cell. Give that a second to adjust and catch up. There we go. There we go. So there's your plant cell. Ribosomes, really small down here at the bottom. I'll show you. Just zoom in on it. Um, if you follow the end of the green arrow there, there's those little black things. And they're all over the place. And their job is to make protein. So you'll find them hanging out near the nucleus for a reason. It's your nucleus, the command center of the cell, that says how to make protein. So ribosomes tend to be fairly close to it. I think the animal cell is something that you probably is a little bit more simple for students. They've seen it before. But once you look at the plant cell compared to the animal cell, you're like, well, geez, you know, like plants and animal cells both have that little red guy, mitochondrion. In grade 11, we studied the endosymbiotic theory, the internal symbiote theory. And we learned that a mitochondrion, kind of interestingly, is a little bacterium that makes energy. It just tantalize you a little bit there. We'll talk more about that. But it's a symbiote. It came to live inside of our cells. The cytoplasm, oops, there we go, is just the goo everything's floating around in. There's those little cytoskeletal fibers down there and uh, down here. We'll put a little X there. Um, that help give strength to the cell. Lysosomes. If you look at that and you say, hey, Mr. B, that looks like a, uh, like a vesicle, you'd be right. They're quite small, but they're a special vesicle that holds digestive material. Enzymes for breaking things down in the cell. All right, let's come over here. See, the neat thing is once you kind of learn one cell, you know the other. 
There's the nuclear envelope, which we already saw right there. That's where the nuclear envelope ends. Nuclear pores, these black things here, these holes that let out genetic instructions on how to make things in the cell. We've got our DNA, our little squigglies floating around in the nucleoplasm, the cytoplasm. We've got our nucleolus here. Now that's a special dark region in the middle of a cell and it is, it's an interesting region. This is where ribosomes are born. This is where they're made. Our little protein guys come from there. And it's an interesting region of the cell which we'll go into more in a bit. The nucleus is just the name for this overall structure in the middle of the cell. They call it the command center, but there's a lot more to it in grade 12 that you have to know, including what the nucleolus does inside. All right. When you look at the skin of the cell, we'll just back up for a second here. When you look at the skin of the cell, when you look at this right here, I'll draw an X right through it that skin is a lot more complicated uh, than you knew. In fact, there's a lot going on there. And we cover that, there's, there's a total chapter on this. But when you look at that skin in cross section or from the side, you'll see that it's made up of this flexible, what we say bilayer. And the reason we call it a bilayer is because if you look closely, these little guys, make up one layer and then on the other side you can see the same little guys facing but pointing um, in the opposite direction like that. So this is layer number one and this is layer number two so we call it a bilayer. Now there's cholesterol in there you might have heard of that it actually gives it structure. There's these little guys on the outside that mark your cells as belonging into your belonging in your body and some of those markers are made out of protein some are made out of uh, sugar and there's a lot going on uh, in the skin of your cell these little purple guys here are proteins and some of them give structure some of them let things through your cells are very good at concentrating materials so some of these proteins um, are even enzymes that do jobs right in the skin of the cell. The skin is very alive, just like ours. It does tremendous jobs. Uh, it keeps things out. It lets things in. It lets things out. And uh, transportation mechanisms are uh, a, a chapter in this uh, in this course. Here's another view of it, sort of artist's rendition. And what I like about this one, the reason I included it, was you could see how these filaments are kind of going throughout the cell providing sort of reinforcement. Don't worry about the names, we'll get to all of these names as we go along. Just interesting to see all this embedded in the cell membrane. Now there's different membranes for different things but generally the plasma membrane its job is just like your skin. You've got to separate the inside of a cell from the outside first order of business. Otherwise, you can't build up nutrients inside, right? You can't keep bacteria and viruses and things out. And it's sort of hard to remain a living organism if you don't do these things correctly. The importance, though, is that you create a selectively permeable layer. And by permeable, what they mean is porous. You can only let some things through. Your skin has pores. Your skin will let things through. For example, oxygen gets through. Um, it just not very much. It's not enough for us to go without a respiratory system. Um, carbon dioxide can get out of your skin. So it's you. It's got to let some things in and some things out. It's it. The analogy of it being a window screen is a very good one. And we'll study what things get in and out as we go along. Oops, moving up. This is the portion where, um, as you're listening to me, I, I, I put this all together as a large series. You can listen to this lecture over time. There's a great deal of things to take in. But now we have to get into the parts of the cell. For example, the nucleus. Now the nucleus, like I say, looks <laughs> that's not a moon. It's a space station. I'll borrow a uh, Star Wars analogy here. It 
is a very interesting structure. It's the command center. It's in charge. By command, your DNA inside of the nucleus makes all the things in the cell. When you were a zygote, it was this DNA material here. I probably could use a better color here. It's all this DNA material here, which caused your cells to grow and differentiate in a nerve cell, skin cells, heart cells. It says what things should do and what they should become and how your cells regulate themselves. So it's the boss of the cell. Absolutely. Now it has an envelope. We saw that, which is the skin on the outside. And that it's that's a bilayer. It's also porous. We'll just I have to back up a little bit here. And I'll switch my color here to a dark green. The messages on how to make things have to get out of the cell and they come out of these pores here, these nuclear pores. And those messages go out and instruct the cell on what to make. So it's really important to understand your DNA doesn't get out. Something else does. Think of it as a copy. And that copy instructs your cell on how to make all the things it will ever need to survive and grow and reproduce. But those pores, those little nuclear pores right there, are the gateway for those messages to get out. If they don't, not going to be a much consequence. A cell wouldn't survive. So chromatin is, when, let's back up a little bit. When they discovered DNA, they discovered um, chromosomes. And th that literally means, chromosome means colored body. And what was in the colored body were these little DNA threads. And if you've done a DNA extraction, um, some of you might have done a strawberry DNA extraction with soap and a plastic bag. If not, this year, we're going to do a wheat germ extraction. And when all is said and done, when we're finished, you can pull up the DNA on a paperclip and look at it. DNA is not that hard to extract, as it turns out. You just need to be good with soap and a little bit of cool alcohol. But uh, DNA itself is kind of like balls of yarn. Like the DNA would be like this. But every now and then, uh, what our bodies do is we wrap it around something called a histone see here uh, so that it has something to hang on to and it's interesting to study these little protein balls these little histones right here because they they give uh, DNA threads uh, their structure in as they're floating around inside of our nucleus but more about that later the nucleolus is a place where the ribosomes are made and ribosomes are all about protein and protein construction. So little protein making machines. The ribosomes take their orders from what comes out of the nucleus, those little genetic instructions. But ribosomes had to come some, from someplace, so ribosomes are made in the nucleolus. And it's interesting because you're your DNA has instructions on how to make ribosomes. And later on in the course, that will be very intriguing to you when we study DNA. I promise. So the nucleolus, here it is actively making what's called ribosomal RNA. So the R stands for ribosomal. When you look at um, the nucleolus, it's, uh, when it makes ribosomes, they're actually genetic material that are turned around to make proteins. What do you need to know? Just understand that ribosomes are made out of a special kind of genetic material called ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid makes a lot of sense. Here's a look uh, again at DNA. It's kind of neat. I mentioned that they're wrapped around these little, uh, these little protein balls called histones. And I say always use the analogy of um, wrapping yarn around a spindle. It's not really much different than that because your DNA itself needs something to hang on to because when we look at DNA this uh, we call it a twisted helix. You've probably seen this thing before. It's like a ladder and you sort of twisted it and it looped around. Yeah that that structure needs something to hang on to. 
It's very small, two nanometers in diameter, and even it needs a little bit of support. Your ribosomes, we saw them uh, out in the nucleus, they just look like these little sort of dots. And when we see them on endoplasmic reticulum, we, we say that that endoplasmic reticulum is rough. Ribosomes make proteins. So what you have coming out here is a um, protein chain. And this over here is the genetic message that came out of your nucleus. It came from your DNA. And we'll get to that later. But if that's your genetic instructions, whoop, instructions, run out of room. If those are genetic instructions, then what your ribosome does is it's basically just a machine. And all ribosomes ever make are proteins. And they just do it based on a set of instructions. What's fascinating in this course is we'll say, here's what your DNA code was. The genetic message that's going to leave is going to be this then. And this is what the ribosome makes. It's sort of a one, two, three step pro process. DNA, the message that goes out, and then the protein that gets made. So ribosomes, if you look at them, kind of interesting. Sometimes they're sort of described as a hamburger. Um, a ribosome will have a sort of a big subunit and a small subunit like that. And I can just sort of freehand that for you. And a ribosome, its job, let's take a, is to take a genetic message, read it, sort of think about it, and act upon it, and make... Let's choose purple based on the message to make a protein, to make a protein chain like that. That's sort of a, a rehash of the last diagram, but I think you get the idea. You could think of a ribosome almost as a, a stamper. And that analogy will come in handy later on when we study exactly how protein is made. But that message, that little brown thread right there, that message is called the message RNA. And it is a good analogy to say it's a recipe. It's a recipe for a protein that a ribosome has to follow. So mRNA, the message RNA. So we don't call it DNA because the only place you ever find DNA is in the nucleus. So what do you call that stuff that's a genetic message that isn't in the nucleus? Let's call it RNA. This is messenger RNA more about that later. Just think of it as the message for now. You want to know it by name. Okay, give it a second here to come up. So the ribosomes, because they make protein, are found all over the place in the cytoplasm. And they're found pretty close to the nucleus too. Let's see if my uh, slide is coming up here. Let's see. If it isn't. I might need to reload it. It's not. So I'm going to reload that. Let's see. Let's load it from my Biology 12 files. So I'll load it from my, I just keep them in Dropbox. And there we go. I'll just reopen the file. go. Let's, thumbnails. I think I can sneak down to where we were. It is quite a lecture. There's a lot to this. Um, there we are. Hmm, interesting. The file stopped loading. So we're back and when you look at your rough ER Here's all the ribosomes, those little guys. And I'll just call them ribosomes for short. And this is why we call this rough endoplasmic reticulum, because of the studded ribosomes all over it. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum has none. Now, rough endoplasmic reticulum is more about protein production, 
because of all the ribosomes making proteins. Whereas smooth endoplasmic reticulum is more about what we call lipid, uh, fats, oils, waxes, making that kind of thing. And even processing alcohol. Your liver has a ton of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Think of it this way. The rough is a protein making sort of factory. Smooth, not so much proteins, more of the fats and the oils and the waxes. Now when you look at endoplasmic reticulum, let's just back up a little bit. just want to show you this. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go back just a skosh. When you look at endoplasmic reticulum, go back to the animal cell, there we go. When you look at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, um, specifically right here, let's change my pencil color so you can see it. This brown should work. This is the rough endoplasmic reticulum here. You'll notice that it's right close to the nucleus. That's because it's taking orders. You'll notice the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, of course, isn't so close to the nucleus. The rough is literally coming off of the nucleus. You notice that it's attached. The smooth doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Okay. Sometimes students will, cons will uh, confuse smooth with the Golgi apparatus, but the Golgi apparatus has that crazy curved pancake look. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum just kind of looks like these sort of tubular network. So nice, uh, nice distinction there. Uh, so you can keep it separate. There we go. Just zoom back to regular size. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, as we say here, is attached to the nucleus because it needs to get its recipe from there. And the ribosomes stud the surface. That's what makes it rough. And when you make proteins, you can make proteins that that stay in the cell. You could say you might need new cellular materials. Or, alternatively, you can make proteins that you secrete. Where are you? Being uppity on me. Here. There we go. Or you can secrete those proteins and send them out of the cell. So what would be an example of that? Well, you might want to secrete um, materials that are uh, released from the body. Some uh, neurotransmitters are proteins, things in your brain that carry signals. So some proteins do need to leave. Some of your hormones, for example, need to leave insulin, glucagon, uh, growth hormone. These things need to leave the cells. They're, they're supposed to go around the body and, and send messages. For example, growth hormone tells your cells to take in nutrition and grow and divide and it's the reason why your bones get longer so it's pretty good that we have secretory proteins because we need these pro we need proteins all over our body to help maintain um well not just not just our regulation of our height but they also we also secrete proteins for example that are enzymes right our stomach will secrete proteins that help us to digest food so if a steak arrives in your stomach, your stomach might secrete, um, or not might secrete, it'll secrete enzymes to break down that steak. So secretory proteins are part of the plan. Interesting when you look at the, um, the proteins, when you get to the end of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's like a journey, right? When you get to the very end, you can see this ribosome here sending in its, sending in its payload. Just draw that with a. Let's go back to purple. You can see it's sending its material in here. So here's a protein. And as that protein travels to the end, there it is. It reaches the end, pinches off, and you get what's called a uh, vesicle. And that vesicle is. It's, it's almost like. A, no, it's, it's like a transport system you've got a product now it needs to go somewhere and at this point the rough endoplasmic reticulum has done its job it's made the protein let's say this is an enzyme and it's Golgi's job to say where that goes pop along here there we 
go. Interesting. So I'll just go to Golgi for a second here. I might need to reload this. Huh, that's interesting. I'll just pop ahead. It's just it's just one ahead. I, I won't sit on it for very long. If uh, a vesicle is made containing a protein or some product, it's got to know where to go. So Golgi itself, those vesicles will will uh, bump into it, and then they get basically tagged and told where in the cell to go. Now that's at this level in in uh, biology twelve, we don't look at that in specifics but when you get into first and second year biology you'll study that a lot more in depth and it's pretty interesting that we have a biological sort of Canada post telling all of our sort of cellular products where to go in the cell it's fabulous there we go get rid of the thumbnail view but we should talk before we get too far along um, rough endoplasmic reticulum had a cousin a brother a sister if you will called smooth that doesn't have ribosomes on it and because the ribosomes aren't on it it um, doesn't produce proteins in fact it's not a protein factory so I'll just highlight that that's not its job instead it will make um, things like steroids lipids and by lipids I meant uh, previously a, a fat an oil or a wax that's what a lipid is and it can direct those uh, to be constructed and then Golgi will tell it where to go in the cell steroids they, we always associate that um, with sex hormones for example but steroids are just little messages that tell your cells what to do in the body you know about testosterone and estrogen those are the two of the most common ones um, at puberty they make boys boys and girls girls right and what will kind of blow your mind is that steroids are a kind of uh, what we call a lipid. They're, think of the mores being in a sort of a different class, sort of the fat oils and waxes. That comes up in biochem, but smooth plasma reticulum is more about what we talk, call lipids. Now, your liver cells have a ton of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And that's because one of the jobs of smooth endoplasmic reticulum is they'll they'll take a, a product, for example, like alcohol, and they'll detoxify it. And a lot of food, um, or not a lot of food, when we digest food in our uh, bodies, the first trip the blood makes after it leaves your digestive tract is straight over to the liver to get detoxed. Because imagine you had eaten something um, that was toxic. Well, that the only chance that your blood has to be cleansed before it goes to all the cells in your body is to go to your liver. Sounds like a smart idea, right? Send it to the filter organ. And that's how we can um, detoxify our, our blood from things that could poison us, things that we've consumed. Again, we'll come back to our friend here, Officer Golgi, or the Canada Post of the cell, if you will. And it does exactly what's necessary, telling where all these materials where to go. It does it by putting on little biological markers. And those little markers are kind of like directions. So you can think of it as a traffic cop if you would like. Little hollow pancakes, the, the vesicles go through it and they get these little markers tagged on the outside. It's kind of interesting as it goes through. The vesicle will come in and then it'll go up and it'll have, um, oops, I'll choose a different color. It'll have a marker applied to it couple of markers and as it rides up a little bit higher there we go as it rises up uh, it'll have a few more markers attached to it it'll have the previous markers and some additional information will be applied let's choose brown to tell 
this where it should go in the cell and if you want to study that in detail that's that's fab is not for this level but just to, think of them as little sort of canada post tags or mail office tags now we already talked about the lysosome a little bit with the digestive enzymes And enzymes are like little biological machinery that can break down products into other things. You think of digestive enzymes, you're not far off. Uh, one of the reasons that we leave meat to hang for a very long period of time is that when the animal dies and you hang the quarters up, for example, these lysosomes will pop. And it will cure the meat because it will start to the cell will start to self digest. That's why sometimes these are called suicide bags. Because if an organism dies, this is like this is like your stomach popping in the middle of your body and all that uh, the digestive enzymes landing on all the organ organs, it would start to digest you. Lysosomes have to be maintained. Uh, it takes energy to do that. And when an organism dies, these things will sort of auto destruct um, your cell. And that comes down to curing meat. Lysosome is kind of interesting. Lyso means to cut. Or break down. And some comes from soma, which means body. So a cutting body, if you want to do a literal translation. Neat thing about lysosomes is as they cruise around in a cell, they can break down old organelles, you know, little pieces of machinery. And um, yeah, they have to be careful. They're, they, I mean, they could, they break down parts of the cell, and you got to, you don't want them breaking down parts of the cell before their time. Lysosomes, you need to note, are extremely important because they are what your white blood cells will use to destroy invading bacteria. Um, throwing lysosomes at an enemy target is like spraying them with hydrochloric acid. It's trying to break it down to destroy it. So your white blood cells will engulf bacteria and viruses and things like that. And then the first thing I come at them with is the lysosomes to just break them down and digest them. And, and your immune system, uh, once those lysosomes do their job, nothing can really withstand it. The, the key would be to get your lysosomes, you know, targeted the right thing. Right. For example, digesting, uh, let's say we could target um, our immune cells at cancer cells and get rid of them efficiently. Or we could target our immune cells at invading pathogens, right? Disease causers, viruses, bacteria. That'd be a good idea. And that's what immunity is all about. Because we have the genetic machinery to destroy invaders. We just have to aim it in the right direction. Lysosomes have to take the same kind of trip same kind of trip um, they'll they're um, well, let's start here hang on if I get the tool to work there we are we'll get the product lysosomes contain contain enzymes and enzymes are a kind of protein so that protein will be created and it'll be put in a little once this pinches off it'll be inside of a membrane and then that lysosome has to do the same thing it the product needs to know where to go so as our friend Golgi here uh, is accessed Golgi tells the um, basically the material that goes through it in this case is going to become a lysosome where to go what to do where to be in the cell sometimes Golgi will tell a vesicle let's say this is a hormone for example might tell this, hey, you're for export. So the Golgi apparatus, what I'm trying to portray here, the Golgi apparatus is doing a lot of things. It's producing different little baggies of materials, little vacu vacuoles. And some of those vacuoles might stay in the cell. Some of those might be specialized vacuoles might become a lysosome, right, in this case, and go around and look for things to digest. Um, in this case, it's secretory proteins. Now there's some lysosomal diseases you can get. They're, they're fairly rare and I'll just gloss over them. 
not, not really to get into any detail. This isn't really testable. But if you get a lysosomal disease, for example, like Tay-Sachs, the problem with that is your lysosomes don't have the ability to break down fats, oils, or waxes, lipids. And you get a buildup in the body, and Tay-Sachs, unfortunately, can, can become pretty fatal with death coming around, you know, sort of the, the first five, six years. Um, it's a genetic disorder. Um, remember that lysosomes contain enzymes, and those enzymes aren't working properly. Okay, as we move along, you have the energy generator. It's also, it's, it's often called the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria. Now, what they mean by the powerhouse is first thing you look at this thing, and you say, well, what is this? This is a transmission electron micrograph, and I know that because it's black and white, um, of basically a bacterium. And the little folds that you're seeing here, I'll just draw them like this. It's why when you see us as biologists, we'll often draw um, an artist version kind of like this. It's on these little folds here where your energy is produced. There's all sorts of enzymes and metabolic activity there. When we look at the mitochondria, the, the energy powerhouse of the cell, what you want to realize about it, and it's, it's we my students always... Um, find this interesting we take in for example something like glucose and even if you go to the hospital if if you can't eat or you're put on an IV to give you energy they'll give you glucose and here's the reason why when glucose goes into a mitochondrion um, it's kind of broken down at first but um, let's just keep it simple when the mitochondria take in an energy source like glucose they release the real energy of the cell. Now the real energy, and I'll show it coming out of this one here, is called ATP. And that is the true energy of the cell. And by energy of the cell, what we're talking about, it's think of it this way. You can use energy, um, we can supply energy to the school um, and when we supply that sort of raw energy, um, we need that energy to do work. For example, we need the lights to come on. We need the machines to function. So there's one kind of energy in this case that's chemical. It's being problematic. So glucose is our, oops, is our chemical energy. That's what we input. But the energy that the body really runs on is this one over here called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. That is the universal fuel. So to get it, we've got to get mitochondria to produce it. Think of it this way. You could load coal into an electrical generator, but it's the electricity that you really need. The electricity is kind of like ATP. Now, notably, it's another chemical compound, but it's the best one there is. And that's the name of the game. So when our cells um, take in oxygen, we take glucose, and we take oxygen, and the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, kind of like a boiler room, produces energy, ATP, then we get a waste product a CO2 gas and you also get a little bit of heat afterwards and because this required oops haha don't want that because this required oxygen right we call it respiration in the cell or cellular respiration that oxygen came from your lungs from your respiratory system from your blood and it's required by all the cells of the body so we say when cells burn glucose to make ATP, we call that cellular respiration. And we'll study that in more detail uh, when we get to the enzymes unit. Interestingly enough, the mitochondrion itself is one of the few things in the cell that's double bagged. So it doesn't just have, if you think about the mitochondrion, I'll just draw it with an M, it doesn't just have its own lipid bilayer there. No, no, no. It's actually got two 
you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why has it got an extra baggie around it? And if you go back to biology 11, you remember, we think that cells swallowed these things and brought them in. Anything that gets swallowed into a cell gets wrapped in its membrane as it comes through that skin-like layer. So this is the cell membrane. And this, go back to purple right here, is the membrane of the bacterium. I mean, it had its own membrane when it came in. It's a little bit more evidence for what we call the endosymbiotic theory, that this symbiote came to live inside of our cells. We just didn't digest it. Why not? Well, this little guy, if you throw glucose at it, makes more energy than you could by eating it. Sounds like a good deal. Yeah, symbiosis. Different symbiosis you've probably heard of, you know, the shark and the remora, the little fish that keeps the shark clean, or the birds that keep the um, giraffes clean, right? So it's, a, it's kind of a great deal for both of them. Uh, we live with mitochondria. Um, they make energy for us. They also do it for plants. Plants made another deal with um, chloroplasts, as it seems. And those were bacteria that could make energy from sunlight. Hmm, sounds like a pretty good plan. See, when you look at plants, they can make their own gas and then burn it for their own energy. Think about it that way. Interesting. I could go on, but I won't. The neat thing about the efficiency, a lot of gasoline engines, they're about a 25% efficiency, right? So one in four particles goes towards, you know, propelling the car, if you want to think about it that way. Mitochondria have double that efficiency. If we could get this, we could get a lot of our oil dependency under control um, if we could do that with cars. So mitochondria are pretty good at what they do. They have their own genetic code. That really puts it over the top. If, because mitochondria have their own DNA, I mean, we can extract these things. We can breed mitochondria outside the body. So they're their own genetic organisms, right? So are they symbiotes? Well, they're not us, and they're living in us. Kind of creepy, yet cool. Plants, as I refer to, um, they're the glucose makers on the planet. They use solar energy, little thing we call photosynthesis down here. Take some carbon dioxide. Interestingly enough, that's a waste product of us wasteful animals. Take some water. And you can produce glucose. And that's a source of energy that everything on the planet relies upon. And here's the waste product that we're all thankful for, oxygen. So if you look at this very closely, if you look at this process in reverse, you'll see that that's cell respiration. But in this direction, it's photosynthesis. Cellular respiration and photosynthesis are exact opposites. That's a good thing, um, plants and animals. Uh, if, if you consider space travel, we would never be able to pack enough oxygen for long distance travel. We would have to generate oxygen. Well, what would you want to take along with you? Well, I'd probably want to take along things like algae, plants, etc., because they could produce oxygen. And in turn, they would use our carbon dioxide waste. So it's, it's a plants and animals. It's a perfect relationship. In a lot of respects, um, the way that they make their chemical energy, glucose, C6H12O6, is because of these little green pancakes they have inside. They're fascinating. Now, these little green pancakes, um, I zoom in, photosynthesis actually happens right along that membrane. And you can see how they're interconnected like that. And through a series of interactions, um, it's kind of like a solar panel. It takes the energy of a photon and transforms that or passes that down a membrane and hammers carbon dioxide and water together. So that's really what it is. It takes a lot of energy to rip apart water and take apart carbon dioxide and kind of put them back together. You think about that. It's like, well, there's bonds that have to be overcome. There's chemistry that has to happen. But the energy of the photon can be used for that. Now, in a transmission electron micrograph, you can see those little green pancakes, the little stacks. 
right there. There they are. And you can see how they're interconnected as they're producing their products. And those are like little membranes. That's that's what they are. Just zoom. There we go. I'll zoom out. So a little bit of identification has to happen in a chloroplast. When you look at a chloroplast, the membrane itself, because it's kind of, um, it's very specialized, is called a th thylakoid. membrane mem for short and if we get enough of these thylakoid membranes uh, that's actually where chlorophyll is found chlorophyll you know the green material you see it in gum you can think of chlorophyll that green chemical as sort of like that black material that we put in solar panels right that's what actually absorbs the solar energy and turns it into energy that the uh, chloroplast can use to make glucose. So little bit of stuff you got to know. So that if you stack them up like this. Then this is what we call a granum. And if you get many, the plural is grana. Right? Grana. There you go. But just remember, it's the green chemical, chlorophyll, that that really is doing all the magic of making, um, well, essentially of making uh, carbon dioxide and water come together to form glucose. This is a neat little image because if you look, you can see the little sort of um, green dots there. That represents the chlorophyll chemical. And it is absorbing light's energy and helping these grana make glucose. There we go. So the chloroplast itself is double bagged, just like a mitochondrion was, which shows that it came to live in the cell. It's a symbiote. And if you stack up all those membranes, the, the fancy term for the membrane is the thylakoid membrane. So let's just put a little note there. And they're, I'll just draw them, thylakoid membrane, thylakoid membrane. It's the membrane edge that's just so important because that's where the chlorophyll is. And that's where our glucose is made, right, in the presence of sunlight. Now, when you look inside, just back up for a sec here. When you look inside of a chloroplast, you're like, well, what's everything floating around in, right? Even bacteria have cytoplasm. We call the special cytoplasm inside of a chloroplast the stroma so i'll just it's here so we'll say it's the cytoplasm just like the cytoplasm in the nucleus was called nucleoplasm this guy's cytoplasm is called stroma and look at that imagine that amazingly enough there is dna in a chloroplast that's because it's a bacterium. Now remember bacteria, they don't have a nucleus. They don't really have a place, uh, like a compartment for their DNA. It's kind of floating around all over the place. But because they have DNA, they are their own independent organism. Not so independent, I guess, anymore because, well, these guys have decided to live with plants. Okay, round in the corner here. It's a big lecture. I'll probably chop it into chunks for you guys, but it's all the material we have to cover. It usually takes several days. All right, moving forward. The cytoskeleton uh, is, if you think about skeletons, you think about bones. And in our bodies, you think about bones and ligaments and connections and things like that. When you look at the cytoskeleton of uh, the cell, it's more, it's like little sort of fibers. And there's three major ones that you need to know. There's actin. That's interesting. That's actually in, in our muscles. That's the reason our muscles can contract. Um, it's a very sort of small little filament, little tiny ones. So we call them microfilaments. And we have, um, you could see up, up here, uh, sort of in red, what that is, is they've added um, radioactive little subunits. And using sort of a specialized microscope technique, 
they can see them glowing um, in a cell. So you can see its uh, sort of most web-like network of these little actin filaments providing structure in the cell. It's neat. They're not just structure. These actin filaments actually provide something for vacuoles, those little bags, to follow. They know where to go inside the cell. And I'll show you. There's a really neat animation on that. Um, but those actin filaments aren't enough. Sometimes when we connect cells to cells, sort of gluing two cells together, we need to make really strong, super fibrous connections like this. And that would be like lots of these. They look like thick cables for a reason. And we call these intermediate filaments. And filament's a good idea. It's it just it's, it's not a microfilament. This is a very strong one to help hold cells together. Otherwise, our tissues would fall apart. So that's very strong cell to cell connection. And we have other ones. Um, these ones here, I'll zoom out, called microtubules. Now what's neat about, I always thought it was neat with microtubules, is you take microtubules are make, made up of something called tubulin subunits and they always float around together. And you start to wrap these things, they, they'll wrap around and they'll make kind of a coil like this and that overall is like a tube. It's hollow in the middle. So we call it a microtubule. So what you have to absorb with this, with the cytoskeleton, is there's three major components you would need to know. Your microfilaments, which are primarily made up of actin, your intermediate filaments, and your microtubules. So sort of like the one, two, and three of the cytoskeleton. I'll pop out, I just want to pop out a reflection for, oh, well, in a moment I will. Um, I should show you this. When you look at sort of the major cytoskeleton of the cell, microtubules are huge, these huge tracks. And when you look at the actin filaments, they're these thinner ones down here. So you can see all the reinforcement and everything there is here. Um, let's pop out for one. Oops. Keep trying to get out of this. There we go. I have to turn reflection off. Okay. Now, if you go to the course site, I'm just in my computer mode here right now. Um, when you look at, uh, let's go here. There it is. Now, this is interesting. This right here is a vacuole. And I've just paused sort of a YouTube movie here. This vacuole is hooked up to this is actually a myosin subunit it's kind of interesting i'm just going to keep it muted if you watch it you can see it moving along a network like this it's just amazing i'll just pause that now i normally don't record movies when i do this those networks of fibers help vacuoles to find their way around a cell so those actin filaments can act as highways and not just reinforcement it's just it's amazing um on the course site that link right uh sorry one sec there you go that is right there if you go down to the lesson the inner life of the cell and uh I'll, i usually show that in class but it shows like all the living components of the cell and just how fabulous it is and even though uh this is a project-based learning course i stop and i talk about that and i say look at all these things in this animation what are they and we call that formative assessment let's see if you guys can pick it out let's see if you know it um the animations for example i i had loaded here um the animations you want to do a little guess and check so while I'm here I'll just kind of discuss that you can go over it see what you know right a little bit of guess and check what do they do a little point and click there um, uh, that's not what I wanted um, yeah no that's okay I'll just go back to I'll go back to what we were doing I had a great number of tabs open because that's what I would uh, normally use to um, teach with in the class but um, I'm going over it live here in the lecture so it's all good 
There we go. So our microtubules and our actin filaments. So there's a cytoskeleton there that you never thought you'd see. But plants need them. So do animal cells. So when you look at this network of fibers, sure, it gives shape to the cells. That's pretty straightforward. Um, it also allows things to move around in the cell. So movement in the cell of, of uh, materials. Um, organelles can move around following these tracks. And um, these microtubules and microfilaments, remember that the, the, um, the uh, microtubules are the tubulin proteins, or the little dimers, the little guys, uh, these guys. So the microtubules form these hollow tubes, and the microfilaments are just thin little actin filaments. Um, the intermediate filaments, you probably look at that and say, when do they come up? I tend to think, remember that they're sort of like cell-to-cell -cell connectors. That's a, that's a very good distinction to make. So a network of fibers, shape, strength, allowing things to move around. And the highway systems are the microtubules and the microfilaments. There you go. Check. Now, when we talk about movement, there's movement within the cell because you can follow, um, you can follow these tracks that we call microtubules and microfilaments. Now, interestingly enough, you can use these little, you could think of these little sort of um, structures to help cells themselves move around. You're like, well, that's interesting. What do you mean? Let's go back just for a second. When you look at this one right here, these little hollow tubes, this turns out to be a really good way to make cilia and flagella. Pop back. So cilia and flagella. Look, for example, at a paramecium here. And the cilia and flagella on the outside, well, they have to be made of something. What are those little hairs sticking out? You always knew about them, but you never looked at them up close. Well, it's time to look at them up close. Those cilia and flagella, you'll find cilia in your lungs. They help to move waste products out of your lungs, mucus, etc. Cilia are found in the fallopian tubes of females. They help to move the eggs down towards the uterus. So there's, there's a, they're produced for the purpose of movement. Flagella, well, most obvious one you can think of, movement of sperm. The, the thing about a flagellum is it's just a really long cilium. Cilia is plural, cilium singular. Now, what I want you to key in on is what is that made of? Good news is you've already seen it. What it's made of is those microtubules. A flagellum, and I always love this picture, flagellum will extend off of a cell. Now there's two things you want to pay attention to there. The flagellum is here and then there's a little connection right here where the flagellum is welded on or embedded in the cell. And I'll put a C on that for now because we'll explain what that is. When you look at the uh, sort of the structure of a flagellum or a cilium, it's like a cable. Look at it right here. Look at that. And you say, like an electron micrograph, what we did is we cut, oops, come here, you. We cut through one of these like this. And then we looked at it like this under the microscope. I'll just undo that. And we said, well, what the heck is in the middle? We basically had a cross section. Well, the cross section, as it turns out, had microtubules. So they're like they're those microtubules, those ones that those little um, balls that come together. Let's go back. It's right here. It's right here. It's right here. It's these. Oh, man, what a devil. Sorry, I'll just sneak back. It's this right here. These little subunits that come together to make this sort of coil hollow tube. It's a, so your cilia and flagella are made up of microtubules. True fact. It's a beautiful thing about facts. You just can't make them up. 
And this is them under the electron micrograph. Now there's something you need to know on any assessment that I give on this. I'll ask you the difference between the uh, cilium, sort of the cable, or the flagellum as, as the longer cable, and where it embeds into the membrane. See, if you go through the flagellum, you'll see that there are, I'll circle them, it's called a 9 plus 2 arrangement. What does that mean? Well, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there are nine of these doublets, and then we just say plus there's two in the middle. In biology, that's called a nine plus two arrangement of microtubules. Now, when you get down into the cell membrane, and some sometimes students don't really realize this. You get down to the cell membrane, you get down here, and the cell, right, the cell is here, and you say, well, what is this thing anchoring? It looks a heck of a lot like what's above it, and it does. It's just a little bit different. It's also made up of microtubules. It's called the basal body, and the way you remember it is uh, it's just a centriole that we've already seen that. Animal cells tend to have these things, right? It's neat because it's and I, I won't do all of them. Instead of doing nine doubles around the outside, it's doing nine triple rings. It's kind of hard here, but I'll do this. And there's there's nothing in the middle. And that's that's how you can you would know. So if you see these microtubules and triplets you know that that is the structure that holds the flagellum or cilium into the membrane. And if you see this structure, you know that's a cross section of a flagellum or a cilium. And then you say, OK, so what is it? Oh, those are microtubules. OK. And microtubules are very good for motion. They're the, the perfect kind of sort of um, cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal fiber that can be used for motion. There you go. Come down a little bit further. When you're looking in the cell and you see structures like this, you're sort of looking at it from the side. And what you're seeing is one of these. It turns out that these can be used not only as anchors for ciliar flagella, but they help your chromosomes divide. So they have a couple of jobs in the cell. And we talk about that at a later date, but just sort of two different species of sort of microtubule arrangements. There you go. So there's your 9 plus 0. But in this case, it's 9 triplet rings. Pretty cool looking. Comes right down to it. It's tubulin protein. Hmm. When you find them, when you find these ones, and they're not... Um, they're not in the membrane. When they're in the membrane, they're called a basal body because they're the base of something. When you look at centrioles, it's the same thing, right? Nine plus zero arrangement. But this version floating around in animal cells is good at uh, helping cells to divide, to pull the chromosomes to the new daughter cells when a cell goes to divide. They say that, they say that the, um, these little guys go to what you call the poles or the edges of the cells when they divide. If you've studied mitosis, which is when cells reproduce, you would have seen these little guys. This is what they do. Um, and this, this diagram doesn't really do it justice, but your centrioles kind of go to the end. And then they cast out their nets. And what they do is they pull the chromosomes to the edges so that your cells can pinch off so that you get two identical sort of dot daughter cells. Without getting into too much of the uh, of, of what you're seeing in this diagram, these right here, these little nets, oops, hmm, these little nets are used to reel in the chromosomes. And what will blow your mind is 
this this guy right here is made up of microtubules, right? Centrioles, basal bodies, are microtubules. But what they cast out are actin filaments. It's almost like fishing line. And they can reel in the chromosomes. So microtubules and actin filaments uh, are used for many things in the cell. Pretty cool, eh? All right, getting away from sort of the thick of things. Cells in multicellular organisms are very specialized. We've got nerve cells and we've got lung cells and cardiac cells. We need that because we have to divide all these jobs in the body up. Some of the cells have to do the thinking. Some of the cells have to do the carrying of the oxygen. Other cells have to kill germs and invaders. So we refer to that as a division of labor. Think of it this way. It's like working in a factory, right? Nobody can do everything. So cells in multicellular organisms are specialized. And that's a good thing. Otherwise, well, I guess we'd have to be single cells, like protists, right? Where they try to get the whole job done as a cell. It's not as successful. If you think about our structure, you start out as a cell and you get a group of cells together to form a tissue. Maybe that's like lung tissue. And if you get enough tissues together, you can form an organ. Okay, so like, well, your lungs are an organ, but they're made up of many tissues, right? Connective tissue, respiratory tissue. There's all sorts of different cells in there. You get an organ. And if you get enough organs, you can have your digestive system, your circulatory system, your respiratory system, your excretory system, right? Your nervous system. It just goes on and on. So you get organ systems. And if you get all those together, well, folks, you got yourself an organism. That's why they call it an organism. True story. At the tissue level, if you think about your skeletal muscle cells, or skeletal, if you'd like to pronounce it that way, that's all about motion. Okay, so here's a different kind of muscle cell, the kind that you can't really control, right? Your cardiac muscle for your heartbeat, your bones for supporting your body, nerve cells. Yeah, those, I mean, those are tissue, but if you get enough of them together, you get brains and spinal cords and all kinds of things like that. It's all about working together as a unit. Animals heart, brain, stomach. It's interesting because in plants, if you ever ask someone, you say, what are the three basic parts of a plant? And people blank out. And it's really roots, stems, and leaves. Um, well, plants on land anyways, a little bit different in the ocean. But you can see how plants have specialized kind of unit systems, right? They have their organ systems. In animals, it's just a little more obvious. Well, that's probably because you're an animal. And here they are. When you study biology 12, um, in days of old, you, you covered all of these systems, um, muscular, skeletal, and you went through all of them. Now we go through pretty well most of them. Um, the endocrine system one down there where it says hormones, we cover that too, but that comes up throughout the course. So don't worry, you'll learn about the endocrine system because I'll keep mentioning it and it'll drive you crazy. And yay, we've reached the end of the massive lecture. Um, an organism is really all these things. Going from the tiniest cells to the, the tissues coming together, all the way down to an organism. Think about it this way. Blue whales have microscopic cells. Look at the size of a blue whale. There you go. You've got an organism. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of cell structures. It's been fun. Have a good one. And thanks for listening.